so anyway so yesterday we uh, just uh, introduced you know fuller to this entire discussion so his essential position is that uh, law and morality cannot be separated unlike what uh, hl hart says so uh, he says if you remember from our discussion yesterday that uh, whether law is valid okay uh, cannot be you know determined based on what the law says so for example um, if i uh, so yeah I, I think that will be a little problematic example but yeah uh, so for example um, you know i ask you to do something okay um, and then you say why should i do that and i say because i say so okay so the authority here cannot be because you know i say so the same thing applies here to that of the case of law okay the law is valid why because the law says so so the justification for validity cannot be that well law says so in fact that's the case with most of the you know the you know reveal so called reveal scriptures okay those are the words of god why because the scriptures say so so yeah that's that's what's been you know that's the flaw that has been found here by our philosopher lon fuller that law's validity cannot be ultimately traced from the law itself okay it has to be somewhere else so where else would that be he says it has to be from the moral attitudes of the people okay it has to eventually at the end of the day okay despite differences on many other issues okay at the end of the day it has to be based on the moral attitudes of the people how do the people perceive of the law okay because we all at the end of the day expect the law to have you know certain roles certain functions certain purpose to serve uh in the community uh that we are part of okay so at the end of the day the uh, you know the quality of law will be determined based on the quality of the you know rules uh, which are there okay moral quality of the rules which are there okay and to what extent people will subject themselves to those laws will determine will be determined based on the moral qualities that those laws possess okay so he uses the term fidelity it's so essentially the loyalty the fealty that we owe to the law will depend on its moral quality so you may come across one or the other laws which are not morally you know up to the expectation that you have but that's okay but if the legal system overall or the, or the laws generally if they do not have those moral qualities okay then obviously uh, people will not have loyalty to such laws okay so if that is the case what happens then if more and more people think that well these laws are not you know morally good okay so the kind of morality that we are talking about is what you know fuller says calls as um, external morality so the substantive moral quality we are referring to because people do not really know as much about the you know Uh, internal morality that we are going to discuss later but then people's loyalty to the laws will depend on to what extent they are in consonance they are in agreement with some ideas of external morality if they are not then the authorities then the rulers have to use force and uh, dominance and power to uh, you know get compliance from people okay you will see okay a repressive regime okay in which more and more laws are made which are not you know which do not possess this moral qualities you will see more and more force being used against its against its own people you will see uh, you know lati charged okay water cannons targeting people okay you will see more of this you know uh, cases if the laws do not possess the moral quality so that is essentially what what is being you know talked about here you will see that in a repressive regime you will also see you know army okay the military which is supposed to be to defend the country against external threats as well you know being used against you know its own people but in that will be one extreme case but generally you will see that force will be used more and more to repress and suppress people that is what has been said here okay so he is saying that a law that does not possess this moral quality will lack will uh, not have loyalty and fidelity from the 
uh, you know, from the from the people. Okay. So um, he, he his theory, however, though as you will see, is not about any such external moralities. Okay. He focuses instead on this instead on this idea on of internal morality. Okay. So what is internal morality? We are going to discuss. Okay. So. Now, where does that internal morality arise from? It's from the fact that we discussed other that law has certain purpose, okay? Law has to serve certain purpose you know, of human coordination and communication, okay? So, it has to serve that purpose and for it to be able to serve that purpose, it has to possess certain moral quality and that's what, you know, our philosopher here, Lon Fuller, calls this internal moralities okay so these are certain qualities not the substantive morality that will be an outcome okay but these are certain qualities that the laws the enactments the statutes have to possess for them to become law at all okay if they consistently you know lack one of those you know in qualities of internal morality they are not law at all is the central position uh, that HLA Hart has okay so yeah to elaborate on what we had already discussed yesterday he says that uh you know law is law is not just a, a random object that you come across okay thing that seems to have no purpose a rock a stone that you come across okay it's not like that law has a certain purpose okay it's a purposive enterprise okay uh, so law cannot be understood, defined, okay, in the absence of that purpose that it serves, okay. So I had already given you an example, okay, that if you were explaining something to someone who doesn't know what it is, okay, then mere description of it will not convey enough, you know, uh, for that under other, other being to understand what it is. So I was telling you about you know, you describing what is a chair to someone who doesn't know what a chair is. So hypothetically, let, you know, it be some alien, some Martian. You are going to explain what a chair to, you know, that Martian. Okay. How do you do that? So usually we, we would say that, well, it has four legs, okay, upon which you have this flat surface. And then, you know, there is another portion that goes up, okay. Um, now, if that other person does not, you know, does not know what chair is, what purpose chair serves, then this description is definitely not sufficient enough. Even if you draw it to, you know, that person and then show it, okay, even that will not be sufficient for that person to understand, okay, comprehend what it really is, okay. You have to tell that, you know, being that it's something that you use to sit on, okay, then it makes little more sense, okay. Now the purpose of chair is for one to sit on. Similarly, law also is a purposive, okay, enterprise, okay. So we cannot merely give a description of what law is. We also have to explain and understand the purpose for, you know, that law serves, okay. So what purpose is, is it that law serves? So we already discussed that. We live in a community with Different people have you know, having divergent aims, you know, different projects, okay, different ideals, okay. So it is highly likely that we disagree about many things, okay. So, and then we could not have left it only up to us to figure it out how to coordinate, you know, among us. So that role is played by, you know, laws, okay. Laws tell you how to coordinate and how to communicate amongst yourself, okay. So yes. That's the purpose that law serves, okay, to enable, okay, to make it possible for us, the individuals, okay, to communicate and coordinate, you know, our activities, okay. Otherwise, it will be chaos. So, to avoid that, you need law. So, that's the minimalistic, okay, purpose with which he starts. He's not saying that law is, you know, for, you know, law is there for us to reach certain kind of, you know, moral exaltation is not talking about all those higher, higher ideas okay that you have to be best version of yourself you have to be the you know you you have to be you know enlightened like buddha is not saying anything of that sort okay he's merely saying that its purpose is to facilitate coordination and communication among people in a community 
who might have divergent views, who might have divergent interests that quite often come into conflict and uh, conflict with, you know, one another. So that's the purpose that law serves, okay? And you have to define law keeping in mind that purpose, okay? So yes, uh, so how is this position different from most of the positivists, okay? The positivist, as you have seen, okay, so, um, you know, essentially Bentham and, you know, Hart says that law is unidirectional, one-way projection of authority, you know, that's between someone who's superior and someone who is politically inferior, okay, and the um, political superior makes commands and political inferior has to uh, follow it, and if it doesn't, then there'll be consequences. That seems to be the case of gunmen writ large. Then you have H.L. Hart who's talking about this internal aspect, okay? He's also talking about acceptability, but he just does not go far enough. So this is where our philosopher, Lon Fuller here, taking it to the uh, you know, next stage, okay? Saying that, yes, <clears throat> laws, you know, purpose reveals the second, you know, aspect of the enterprise, okay? It's reciprocal, nature, the law cannot be conceived as whatever the ruler wills if its purpose is to facilitate human coordination. So yeah, the ruler has to facilitate coordination, okay, and, and a communication among people, okay, that's what the ruler has to do. But it cannot be based on, you know, ruler merely telling us what to do and what not to do, okay. The ruler also has to take some feedback, okay, from the people. So ruler has to listen to people, okay. It cannot be mere projection of authority. That's what I tried to explain to you yesterday through that example of a relationship, okay. If it, it, it it's not really a relationship but a case of subserviency and slavery if the one person in that relationship always tells the other person what to do, okay. It cannot be so. There has to be mutual communication for it to be considered as a relationship of love, faith, whatever, okay. In a similar way, legal systems also work uh, just like that, okay. The rulers have to listen to the people, okay. If there is complete lack of this reciprocal communication, okay, reciprocity, then obviously, you know, there is something that the uh, you know, that is wrong in such legal system, which is quite obvious to us, okay? It eventually will degenerate into, you know, some kind of extreme version of dictatorship. It just does not happen overnight, as you know. It happens over a period of time. To what extent are people vigilant, okay? To what extent are people willing to stand up for, you know, this, okay? That that definitely matters. But so here's what what is being said, that yes, the more, you know, the less the communication there is, the less reciprocal reciprocity between the rulers and ruled, the more dictatorial the re and repressive the regime will be. And then it crosses certain limits and beyond that limit is not what they have been called the legal system at all. And the laws there are not law at all, is the thesis that he, you know, propounds for us. Okay, so I hope, you know, this is uh, quite clear to you. Uh, so it says that it is, you know, uh, it is common knowledge that laws made by democratic legislatures do not always human coordination and often impede it, yet history shows that legal systems that consistently fail to serve uh, laws, uh, human purpose, degenerate into a dictatorial command system. So as I was explaining, yeah, it's not that, you know, laws always have to fulfill all these requirements that he's talking about, but then there's a threshold that should not be, you know, uh, you know crossed. And the moment that is crossed, it just de degenerates into a dictatorial command system. And then you can no longer call it a case of legal system. Uh, and then the third aspect, okay, apart from the purpose, reciprocity, the third, uh, uh, you know, aspect that he identifies uh, of law is that it is an ongoing enterprise. That it's not, legal systems are not static systems, okay, they are changing, they are um, so yes, it's an ongoing, you know, enterprise, okay? So what does he mean by that? He, he has a very important thesis that he makes with respect to this, okay? Saying that, well, um, legal systems always have the scope of improving, okay? So I told you yesterday that if there's a scale, okay, and you draw a line here, okay? I to told you about, you know, uh, you know, a morality of duty and morality of uh, aspiration, okay? So there is a minimum that you have to do, okay? 
that has to be there and those qualities, those minimum qualities have to be there in a legal system for it to be called as a legal system and the laws to be called as law. But it just does not stop there. It is possible for you to improve and refine further. Okay. So yes, that scope is always there for the legal system to forever strive to achieve that ideal which is forever beyond your reach. Okay. You never get it but you have always the scope of improving it. The idea is that yeah, we should keep improving the legal system. Uh, that's the idea. So, as, so, so that it serves the purpose that he has identified. Okay, so he says, he says that it's an ongoing enterprise, okay, that you do not merely fulfill the morality of duty, but also there are certain aspirational activities, you know, you know, based on which you achieve for some ideal which you do not really achieve, but you forever try and reach close and close to that, you know, ideal uh, which is out there. Okay. So for you to be able to understand a very important example has been given. Okay. Of a car which is, you know, uh, broken down. Okay. It's probably wheels are gone. Okay. It's rusty. It's not able to move. Okay. At all. And then you have, you can imagine the best possible cars which could uh, be out there, okay? So example given is of that of Rolls Royce or whatever car that you, you know, like, okay? Do you see a difference between these two extremes, okay? So what is being said here is that one, the first one which has been described, okay? You can barely call it a car. It does, it does not serve the purpose, okay? That is of moving people or you know, stuff from one place to another. It just cannot do that. You can barely call it a car. But then <clears throat> on the other side, you have, okay, pinnacle of, you know, what you can, you know, refer to as a car, okay? It serves the purpose, you know, closest to the ideal of, you know, that you can imagine, okay? So, yeah. So you have at the one extreme something that you can not even call a car and then the, on the other something which is which probably represents best that ideal idea of a car, okay? But then in between you have so many other possibilities, okay? You have some car which is barely moving, okay? Kind of, you know, defunct, non-functional, you know, semi-functional legal systems. So they do not really fulfill the, you know, uh, moral, you know, moral, um, you know, uh, morality of duty, okay? So, yeah, but yeah, that's the problem, okay, you can barely call it a car, but then you, you come to a stage where you see a car, okay, it's functioning, okay, fine, but then, yeah, beyond that, there are better cars, and ultimately you have something that's the best representation of what is, you know, a car. This silly example essentially tells you that the same applies to legal systems as well. You have broken down legal systems, you have defunct okay, legal system that cannot be considered as legal systems and the laws as laws at all. You have some which fulfill the morality of duty, okay, the basic minimums are, you know, mm, fulfilled. And then you have some excellent legal systems where all these requirements that he is talking about are fully, not fully, but to, to a great extent, you know, are met okay so that's that's what he identifies uh, as the qualities of law now i've been telling you guys repeatedly about this idea of internal morality that <clears throat> when etela hart says sorry fuller says that laws have laws, laws ought to have certain morality moral quality his his idea is essentially based on internal morality but that does not mean that external morality is not important for us it's very important but how do you go for that, uh, you know, external morality? How do you uh, get those external morality? It's based on presence of certain internal qualities of law, which he calls as internal, you know, morality of law. Now, this he demonstrates using the case of, a, you know, aspirant, okay, ruler, a kind of, you know, tyrant ruler, okay, Rex one, a king, you can, you may say, okay who fails, okay, although comes to power with, you know, big promises, high hopes, okay, grand ideals, okay, but spectacularly fails, okay. Why is that? I have shared the story with you guys, so kindly refer to it, okay, I have already shared the, um, so there's a Hart's, you know, extract from Hart's book itself, so go and read it, okay, so because we do not have the luxury of time, so I'll just 
tell you the, about the eight different ways in which you know, he fails, okay? So as usual, he comes back, comes to power, he, he decries all the previous laws as like, you know, inefficient, useless, okay? Nothing has happened until now. All those are laws are hop hopeless. So he comes with this, you know, big promises, okay? So he comes to power and then uh, promises a code, okay? So, but he fails to do so because he does not have the quality of generalizing, okay? Because of that, he fails to, you know, make a code for the people. So, you know, first way in which he fails, okay, as you can see in the reading, failure to ru achieve rules at all. So he fails to make those, make that code, okay? So he fails to achieve any rules at all, okay? In the sense that every command of the ruler is ad hoc and lacks any degree of generality. And if this is the case, the subjects have no guidance as to how they should behave. So people do not know what the law is. There is no, you know, defined code, okay? Matters as they come before the, you know, ruler, he decides ad hoc. So people do, do not know what the law is, okay? Then, you know, because people are not satisfied with this, they ask for the code, okay? So he, with some kind of training, you know, comes up with a code, but does not have the confidence to publicize it because he thinks that, well, there could be mistakes, you know, and no such, you know, uh, aspirant, you know, uh, tyrants want to show that, you know, they are flawed. So, you know, because of that fear, you know, that fear, he fails to publish the code. And again, the next problem is that, yeah, the law is there, but it is not made known, known to people. So lack of publicity of the law. That's the next way in which, you know, he fails to make law. So people revolt against, people are like unhappy. So what he does, okay, they say that we need to know the law, okay. Now what he does, instead of making people, you know, you know, instead of publicizing the law, okay, he decides the cases as they come, okay. Uh, uh, and, you know, he basically does not tell people what the laws are. Okay, laws are there and as people come before him, he applies the laws. Okay, and he says that, you know, it is better that we look at the past, you know, so as to improve our wisdom than look to the future. Okay, so people still do not know how the law is going to apply to them. Okay, so it leads to uh, a kind of enactment of retroactive laws. Okay, and such laws as has been said, no, not only fail to guide the conduct, okay, but also undercut the integrity of prospective rules by placing them under constant threat of retrospective change. So because the, you know, Rex has been deciding the cases as they, as they come before, you know, you know, him, and those rules do not decide pros prospectively how it is going to apply in the future. So that's the side effect, that there is a retrospective effect of the law. So people are not happy with this, you know, retroactive laws, okay, they again, you know, revolt, okay. So their idea is that, please, let us know, um, know of the laws, okay. So this time what he, uh, you know, does is, okay, he publishes the laws, okay. But as he publishes the laws, as it is made known to the people, the next problem that he, saw, you know, finds is that, it is not understandable to the people as well. It's filled with legal jargons, okay? It's filled with, you know, you know, technical terms and, you know, complexities which are not merely understandable to the people but also to the, you know, legal scholars, okay? So the next way that he fails to make law is, uh, you know, by what, you know, that he fails to make it understandable to the pe pe people. It is incomprehensible to the people, okay? So, yes, uh, as people show their dissatisfaction, he takes up uh, the next step, okay? Uh, he now gives it to the uh, experts, okay, to make it comprehensible, okay? So as, okay, as he takes, you know, feedback from experts so as to make it comprehensible, people now understand what the law is. But the problem is the moment people came to know of, you know, what the law is, they find that the laws are contradictory, that at one point, and in one part of the statute, it says that do it. In another part, it says do not do it. Okay. So it gives you direction both ways. Okay. So another way in which he fails. Okay. That there are contradictory rules. And then, you know, again, people start, you know, complaining. So now in like, you know, our Rex here, 
had enough of you know whining from people so he's like i'm going to teach you you know uh, you know whiners a lesson okay so what he does this time is that he makes some very you know difficult changes uh, you know uh, you know some very you know uh, unrealistic okay uh, you know difficult changes in the laws okay so it what are those changes essentially those changes are are such that it's very difficult for the subjects to comply okay so it expects you to do that which is impossible of you so one example which has been given is that suppose you know if there's a summon and summons and you are to be present before the judge within you know uh, 10 days now it makes it 10 seconds that if there's a summons with it within 10 seconds you have to be before the judge okay now you know it's very difficult it's not possible for people to follow such you know impossible commands okay so it's the next way that he fails is by expecting people to do impossible so law cannot expect you to do the impossible okay it has to be rational it has to be logical it has to expect you to do that which is possible for you so yes again people revolt okay now he says that well will make the changes again okay so again it is taken back okay and the experts are asked to remove all the you know impossibilities which are there okay changes are to be brought to the uh, you know un, uh, you know observable rules okay now those changes are brought okay but by the time you know they were ready with this code by getting rid of all the problems okay the times had changed so much that when the rules were published they were no longer reflecting the requirements of the changed time okay now again for you know for it to adjust to the changed times there was requirement of changes within the you know code okay now it becomes difficult for people to comply with the rule because there are frequent changes in the rule so that's another problem which has been identified that there has to be reasonable certainty and some kind of not like complete but some kind of staticity in the rules okay it it cannot be changed every other day because frequently changing rules okay uh, make it difficult for the subjects to orient their action in accordance with the requirement of the changed rules okay now yes our our uh, king here now gets frustrated again now what he does is rest the control back from those people who he had assigned to make these changes and then now he says that well from now on now that i am enlightened now that i have all these experiences i'm going to decide those cases myself okay so with all this you know enlightened you know knowledge okay he starts uh, adjudicating ma uh, you know matters okay he becomes the judge you know himself okay so as people st you know come to him their cases are decided by the king now okay by rex here now after a while what is noticed is that the way that he decides the matter has no relation no connection with the code that you know they had finally and made okay so the court tells you that this is how you are to behave but the king is deciding you know based on how he thinks okay uh, uh, he should decide the matter so there is lack of congruence between the rules which are announced and the way matters are administered matters are adjudicated so these are the eight different ways in which rex fails to make laws okay ultimately only because of all these failures he untimely you know before his time dies and then rex 2 comes to power and what he does he instead instead of focusing on all this on law making he puts some you know i think some psychologist secret whatever okay and some public relations people in power so that's that's what you know it becomes okay that's the farcical you know uh, you know caricature that has been drawn by uh, our you know philosopher here Lon fuller now this is not a story that he you know just you know thinks of out of the blue no this has very much relevance to you know when you know to the times when he had written and the immediately preceding times and even today okay so based on this story of rex he tells us about certain qualities which 
have to be there in law if a legal system in, uh, you know consistently fails in uh, even one of these uh, you know qualities then it eventually fails it, it, it is not worthy of being called a law at all okay so there cannot be total failure and occasionally obviously you will come across laws which are retrospective you know some you know you may come across laws which are not understandable to all of us but then it cannot be consistently so okay so if there is a total failure in either of these eight different you know uh, either in these eight different ways then it is not a law okay it is a bad system of law and then it when it uh, you know crosses that threshold it is not worthy of being called a law so use and then you remember okay it is only a legal system in the pickwickian sense in the sense that a void contract is a contract or a, or that decrepit you know car is a car so yeah so there's a quote quoted you know uh, yeah, you know remark here that you can see says certainly there can be no rational ground for asserting that a man can have a moral obligation to obey a legal rule that does not exist okay so yes it has to be publicized okay or is kept secret from him or that you know came into existence only after he has acted or was unintelligible or was contradicted by another rule of the same system commanded the impossible changed every minute it may not be possible for a man to obey the rule obey a rule that is disregarded by those charged with the with its administration but at the same time the obedience becomes futile as futile in fact as casting a vote that will never be counted so you see this is a very important remark that he has made okay he identifies eight different moral qualities internal moral quality okay internal morality of law as i said okay these are the qualities that laws should possess okay so we also attribute roland fuller as the procedural moralist okay or he is the he gives us this idea of rule of law which is procedural in nature okay why is that because he talks about certain requirements you know which procedural requirements which have to be there which also are substantive you know to a certain extent but not in other ways but these have to be there okay for a law to be called a law so what are those from this story you can identify them as generality that law does not target individuals or specific groups okay now this however does not mean that laws are not made to address a particular group of people which is done so for example laws are made for farmers laws are made for uh, uh, you know doctors okay laws are made for so many groups are there maybe army maybe police okay it is there but then laws cannot generally discriminate among people okay so you will find this for example in your constitutional law lectures okay when you have them in article 14 it talks about equality before law and equal protection of law okay so essentially represents this idea of generality that laws have to be general in nature it cannot be arbitrarily discriminatory that's the idea that he has identified okay so there has to be general rules which will you know be applicable to people generally then publicity laws have to be made public people should know what the laws are you know how it's going to guide their conduct then it has to be prospective law should not be retrospective in nature okay it has to be prospective then laws have to be clear it should clearly tell people what 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 are expected of them how they are expected to you know mold their behavior how they how they are expected to conduct themselves so clarity is an essential virtue then consistency that laws cannot ask you to do two contradictory things okay it cannot ask you to do something and forbear and prohibit you at the same time then it fails the purpose so consistency you know has to be there okay it has to be something you know uh, which is possible for you to comply with okay so law cannot ask you to bring the moon down to earth it's not possible for you to do it so yes um, just an extreme example so the other example if you remember to uh, you know connect uh, to understand okay law cannot uh, expect you to do what is not possible for you then yes uh, the laws have to be constant it cannot be changed every other day and finally uh, you know what the laws are in the laws books okay 
have to be uh, you know followed when the uh, when the laws are administered so what is administered cannot be separate from what is there uh, you know in the law books okay so yes there has to be faithful administration of law so this generality publicity prospectivity constancy clarity possibility of compliance constancy and faithful administration of law are the eight different internal moralities which were um, identified by our philosopher here that is uh, lon fuller uh, so yes this is uh, what he calls this internal morality of uh, law okay now external morality will be something else so external morality would be that you shall not kill you shall not uh, uh, still things like that and none of these qualities that we just described talk about all that okay so are those not important then uh, Fuller nowhere says that those are not important. In fact, if those qualities are lacking in a legal system, a legal system that does not protect your life, your possessions, obviously that legal system will not survive. Okay, but we come to that by virtue of this internal morality. Okay, so both are important. Now, for law to be law, you know, at all, it has to possess these eight different desideratas to certain degrees. Okay, and it cannot fall beyond. You know, certain uh, degree. Uh, so he says that okay, we have to now talk about this degree that you know uh, we've been referring to. Okay, this internal morality of law. Okay, has two different aspects that we have already discussed. Okay, it ha it has morality. There is morality of duty, and then there is morality of aspiration. Okay, now uh, what's the difference between these two? Um, well, uh, this is something you can also relate with, uh, you know, certain other ideas that we, you know, quite often, you know, talk about. So let's take an example. Okay. Uh, so for example, uh, there could be rules that say that don't steal, don't kill. Okay. These are the minimum that is required in a legal system. Okay. In any, any society. Okay. That. Do not kill, do not steal, okay, do not, uh, you know, covet, no, maybe not covet, yeah, how can you regulate how people feel inside, okay. But the basics are this, that you have to, uh, you cannot murder, you cannot steal, and you, resp uh, you know, you have to fulfill the promises that you make, okay, these are basic requirements. But these have to be there for the society to be possible. But that's not the end, okay, above and beyond it, there are certain other requirements that, you know, you, you shall be truthful, that you shall be, you shall, you know, you know, do charity, okay, you should be respectful, okay, all those ideals are also there, okay, so what is the distinction, difference between these two different, you know, uh, kinds of examples that I have given, the first kind, okay, that shall not murder, shall not steal, shall not kill, okay, those are examples of morality of duty for you to understand, okay, and then, your life doesn't end there you can further you know excel okay not excel i mean improve okay uh, your existence by being you know by doing charity okay by being uh, you know respectful okay by doing other duties that you have uh, that you ought to do okay so those are aspirational in nature now i don't totally subscribe to this distinction because when we have certain other you know this discussion later on uh, related to you know so for example well, I can relate this to this idea of positive and negative duty you know mm, you know that we talk about or perfect and imperfect duty that Emmanuel Kant talks about perfect duty is where you also uh, there is a perfect right and there's a perfect duty so if there is an uh, there is a right that you know something be done the perfect duty means that it has to be done imperfect duty would say that if there's a right that you know something ought to be done then there is an imperfect duty that you ought to do it but there is no compulsion that you do it it's up to you uh, so for example and uh, certain other examples are given for so for example you were uh, you know walking you know by the uh, in a road and then you see that someone's you know little puppy or cat is drowning okay then uh, uh, you ought to save it okay so you ought to save it and when you save it people will praise you for that okay praise you for that you have done something great okay uh, but if you do not do it if you fail to do it then there's nothing for people to blame blame you okay 
Well, it's probably understandable in the case of a cat, but imagine this, okay, um, uh, another philosopher, okay, talks about it, um, what's his name, it's, you know, I'm getting out of my head, but another example I can tell you, it is this, that suppose you're walking, you know, by a, by a road, then there's a shallow pool, okay, uh, and you see a baby drowning there, and you are wearing fancy shoes, and you have fancy clothes, so if you just drench them I mean, you, if you just get into that water that will not drown you uh, you can save the baby but if you get into the water then it you know you know you ruin your shoes your fancy shoes or your clothes okay so in such case do you have a duty to save the baby okay or if you save the baby baby have you done something that is praiseworthy obviously you have done something praiseworthy but is it also not a morality of duty or is it merely morality of aspiration? Well, some say that it is morality of aspiration, okay? But I would say, and I think many would also agree that it is also a morality of duty, okay? Not merely aspiration. So what I'm saying is that in a society, okay, we cannot live only based on these rules that you shall not murder, you shall not kill, you shall not, you know, you know break promises. But you also need some other, you know, positive actions on the part of the people okay otherwise that society is also morally kind of bankrupt okay but that's not what our philosopher Lon Fuller is saying Lon Fuller is clearly making this distinction here okay uh, so anyway I hope you understand but Lon, Lon Fuller's distinction applies on here only to the cases of internal morality the examples that we have taken are cases of external morality so the same gradation okay of morality of duty and morality of aspiration also applies to uh, these eight different you know internal moralities that he's talking about that it has to be fulfilled up to a certain extent okay so that morality of duty with respect to this internal morality has to be fulfilled up to a certain extent and then you can go above and beyond that okay now what does that mean so usually you will come across legal systems in which Laws are generally general, okay, they are public, they are prospective, they have clarity, consistency, compliance, you know, consist constancy and faithful administration. But you may also come across certain laws which are very technical in nature, so not everyone understands it, okay, GST being one such case, okay. And then uh, they need not be general all the time, okay, sometimes, sometimes laws could be retrospective as well, okay, but these are, you know, cert certain, you know, uh, flaws in the legal system okay so you may come across uh, certain laws which do not fulfill these requirements but if that legal system generally you know fails in either of these you know uh, you know requirements that HL sorry Fuller is talking about then it fails in its morality of duty but once it fulfills that morality of duty it does not end there it has always the scope to you know uh, achieve for excellence okay so that's what he is talking about now you can definitely put legal systems at you know different you know pedestal on that scale some legal systems are completely defunct you can put them here for example Nazi you know Germany some legal systems essentially the Nordic ones you can put them somewhere here no one goes here because it's not there uh, some other legal systems are probably barely here. Now, I would call ours as barely here. Okay, there's a high possibility that it goes down, my perception. Some are maybe here or here, America, etc. Okay, European countries may be here. Some, not all of them, I'm generalizing. Okay, yeah, so maybe uh, Germany, France, you would like to put here. Okay, so yeah, uh, this is what is being, you know, talked about. Uh, so, but you definitely shall not fall below this or the legal system is not worthy of being called. And then obviously Nazi and, you know, regimes fall much below that. So that's essentially his idea, okay. So he says that a system that fails to provide basic framework of rules that enable peaceful uh, social life fails in morality of duty. That will happen if you consistently fail in uh, all this. Um, you know, eight different desideratas that he's talking about. So, um, yeah, I'm not able to finish the topic even today. So I'll end it here for today and then we'll uh, complete the rest in the next class. So thank you.